Um, thank you, thank you, great speech. So, I'm really honored to be seated here with them. So, uh, it's my special day. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, but just a just discussion, just a free talking about any issues. So, um, if you ask some question to them, so feel free to. Um, maybe I think the device, the program is not working, so I think you might have a difficult to send a message to it. So we, got, we can get the traditional way. <laughs> Hands up! <laughs> and uh, you can ask a question to them. Okay, uh, before them, uh, so I have as uh, I want to ask a question. So I got the one question from my volunteer uh, to the UHI Bankler, Professor Bankler. Um, he read his, your, uh, his, your books. So he felt that when he read that uh, Wealth of a Network, he uh, had many difficult to understand the sentence, the words, very difficult. But your new book, The Penguin and Leviathan, it was so easy to read that. So he was curious about that. Is there any change in your mindset or any <laughs> change in your strategy to <laughs> provide your idea to the people? <laughs> I was just trying to copy Larry <laughs> in his enormous ability to reach out and explain to people. Um, there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs between what you can do with um, more academically oriented work, which actually had much more purchase than I expected it would beyond a, a narrow academic audience, mm -hmm. and doing something that's actually intended to communicate more broadly. I think yeah. at the time of Wealth of Networks, it was important, at least in my mind, mm -hmm. <clears throat> to try to anchor the um, ideas and change and facts in relatively detailed um, let's call it academically legitimate um, um, form that would be persuasive within academia even if at the expense of a broader uh, comprehension. Mm -hmm. I think I wasn't adding to the science of cooperation that I was describing in Penguin and Leviathan. I was simply marveling at the fact that you had across so many disciplines a range of uh, work that was coalescing. They didn't cite each other. They didn't necessarily know about each other. But I thought that it was important for people to understand in some sense that that which normal people understand, mm -hmm. that we are complicated. Yes, yeah, sometimes we want money, sometimes we, uh, we want social. That which we understand about ourselves is not something that being expert and educated should lead you to abandon. In fact, it's something that should. So different books, different purposes. Um, uh, and um, uh, not sure what the next one will be. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And Rari, um, you mentioned the, the ceremony, the weird ceremony the 10 years ago. I said that you are you're talking about the freedom, but the atmosphere is not free. <laughs> so, but the one thing that you didn't know, so at the time, some professor that came to the event and for uh, providing some congratulational address, but he, uh, he just heard that this event is uh, about copyright. So he said, we need to protect the copyright and we need to defeat the piracy. So I, I said to the translator, don't translate to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I, I remember that. So, <laughs> so um, I asked you a question to the Boston uh, two, or two years ago, so I asked you, why, why uh, do you challenge this difficult mission, the changing Congress at the time? So I, I said that, you think that is it possible? Do you say that, no, it's not, po it's not possible. Why did that, you said? Someone is need to do. So there's a conversation between us. So, um, 
I mentioned our, the, our vision or our mission is a very long, long, long journey and the lonely travel to the goal. So, um, as of now, what, what can you expect the result? So, do you can, the, can you expect your mission is uh, succeeded, successful, or get us some effort? You know, I, um, I started um, as a very pessimistic person. And I've become more and more optimistic. Um, and, uh, and about this issue in particular, I'm incredibly optimistic. I think, you know, in the United States right now, there's an incredibly, uh, there's an incredible recognition of the problem that Aaron started me on. It's Democratic and Republican. If, I don't know if you've been following this crazy man, Donald Trump, <laughs> running for president in the United States. Um, we, are, we in the United States are experts on Donald Trump because for eight weeks, the only thing on television was Donald Trump. It was every single news show, every single hour of every single day, it was Donald Trump. And he would give a speech and there would be an hour long coverage of Donald Trump giving a speech. More coverage of Donald Trump than the president of the United States. It's just the insanity of American media. But anyway, Donald Trump um, uh, in the second debate said, uh, you know, I, uh, I basically own all you people talking about the other presidential candidates. He's saying, I, you know, I, I, um, I'm giving all of you money. One guy said, no, no, you didn't give me money. If you want to, that's okay, but you didn't give me money. But, um, but saying in the Republican primary that these people are not independent of the donors who give them money and they can't be trusted to make decisions that are in the good interest of the public, but instead, and to have that spoken in the Republican primary was like somebody questioning communism in the Politburo in 1970, right? It's just like unheard of. You wouldn't say something like that, but that's what they said, and it dramatically changed the opportunity for that part of the American political spectrum to begin to acknowledge and think about that. That's a moment of incredible hopefulness because, um, you know, whether in this cycle or whether in this race or whatever, there's, it's inevitable that we're coming to see just how deeply corrupted and, and failing in the sense the government is, and um, and I can't be anything but uh, you know optimistic that that recognition leads to something in response. So when I spoke to you, it might have been a bad day, uh, <laughs> but um, but no, I, I, as hard as it is to get people on the inside to acknowledge it or people um, on the inside to think about how it's going to be fixed, I, I actually am very very optimistic that um, we're going to find a way to do this. That's great. Okay, thank you. And Ryan. Uh, how many years are you staying in this community? The two years? This as a CEO? Uh, CEO since yeah. June of 14. Uh, so a little so, over a year. Uh, so what is your experience or what is your uh, idea about this the community? So yesterday was a lot of fun for me. We had um, a number of people in this room who were in a kind of day zero conference as the affiliate network, which is, you know, when Larry talked about internationalizing Creative Commons, this idea of uh, local communities coming together around an idea and building something greater than just the licenses. And I think that's the thing that I didn't expect as much coming into CC was how much power lived in the network. Um, and so what, what I'm really excited about is, you know, I think, you know, I hear a story about how legislative change can unlock things that are broken at the systemic level. What I also want to think about is what can a room full of people who share these values and every single day have opportunities, what can we do together to build that bottom-up piece that builds the environment that allows that to happen? Because I think publics give governments permission to act and a noisy public and an engaged public creates the room for people like Larry to say the things that need to be said to audiences that need to hear them. So I think that's, that's what I want to see for the next three days is that conversation about what we can do uh, to support these people who are articulating the challenges and actively trying to change things from the top. Uh, what can we do from every community in the world? Okay, so my mission to provide you a time for a Thinking about your question is completed. Okay. <laughs> Open the floor. Yeah. The mic. Jogi soon. Mic. Jogi Kadera. Uh, 
Well, hi. Uh, if you don't mind sharing uh, me sharing my uh, personal experience, so I actually worked on our, my PhD dissertation about Creative Commons license in 2005. So I had a pleasure of meeting like Professor Lessig in 2006 in San Francisco, and then I came back to my you know motherland, Korea, two years ago. So. Uh, it's great pleasure to meet all of you in this conference and welcome. And I just want to ask you, as uh, CC license have been adopted in uh, different countries around the world, and as you are seeing uh, and me meeting this uh, global community of CC you know, people, have you uh, noticed any uh, differences uh, among those countries, because each country has different legal background and then you know different culture. So I bet you have seen some similarities, but I also wonder whether you have seen uh, any notable differences among countries that have been adopting CC license. So I, I guess my own experience is what CC did was give people a way to name a very human experience that they were having long before CC was there. This is a point that I think uh, Yochai was making before, that you know, um, we all have this experience of this different way of connecting and sharing. Um, um, and now we have a structure to identify it. And once we have a name for it, we can then see it across a much wider range of contexts. And so when I've met CC people um, everywhere, um, in a certain sense, they're the same in that they want to practice this experience of sharing. Sometimes they're dealing with particular problems. So CC, CC uh, UK was born around the problem of how to take the BBC archive and make it more accessible. Um, it was a very particular problem. It's, it's very different from the way CC Korea was born. Um, so that, those differences exist, but I think the more common fact is we've just found a way to make um, visible an experience and a practice that's always been there, but now because it's visible, we might actually um, encourage it and, and support it in a more uh, overt way. I would just add, add to that that one of the things I've noticed uh, and noticed very early on is that there is not one CC, there are many. Um, and s people do not only identify as CC. They actually cross between multiple groups and they're in this room. When I went to Open Knowledge Festival, there were people from Open Knowledge and Wikimedia and CC and EFF and all of these communities, all the various open communities, and it was true at, at Open Knowledge Festival and at Wikimania and at MozFest and all of these places where uh, a number of you know, all these people who share a bunch of the same values have found different ways to express them, whether it's in open source or uh, in, in Creative Commons or in Wikipedia and all those places. And so, you know, when I think about the commons, I don't think that that's just us. That's actually a much bigger thing that incorporates all those things. Uh, and so the, what's fun here is seeing all that cross-pollination and seeing a number of those same people at different, in different contexts working on different parts of the problem around the world. Uh, hi, uh, Cable Green from Creative Commons. I work on education and our, our work in open policy to help people with money require open licenses on works that are funded specifically from the public. Uh, Yokai, this is a question for you. You talk about how we can rethink economics, rethink economic models and relationships uh, in using a commons framework and how Creative Commons is central to that. More often than not, when our community is engaged with open access or open educational resources or open science or whatever the open topic might be, we argue when we find ourselves on, uh, in discussions on playing fields in the popular press where we have to argue from usually a fringe perspective. We're out uh, you know, on your chart from the X, Y axis. We're out on the fringes and uh, we have to argue why this is a better way. How do we switch those arguments around, as you so eloquently stated in your talk, so that we aren't viewed as uh, the fringe in some of these conversations, but rather as a more rational economic solution 
um, to what currently exists. Too often we're, we're asked and challenged and the burden is put on us about why the change should occur. Uh, what's your advice on how we turn that conversation around to put the burden on existing systems which are no longer working for society? So there's a background. Um, uh, famous American muckraker Upton Sinclair said um, it's uh, hard to explain an idea to a man whose job depends on his not understanding it. Um, uh, and that's part, I think, of what you're encountering. That is to say, there's a hangover of 40 years of dominant economic thinking of a certain kind that makes it easy without thought to reject evidence of something else. And when you're in negotiations with uh, somebody whose business model it is not to do what you're uh, doing, um, <clears throat> it's hard. I think actually in the context of certainly scientific publication, uh, the economic story is fairly straightforward. If you look at what the source of the science is, what the remuneration of the scientists is, you have to make some very, very quirky argument about the added value of the editorial staff and the high quality typesetting, and even that's only at the top science journals, uh, to make a claim uh, that you could plausibly even need that incentive. And then when you turn around and look at the cost of the libraries and the fact that libraries are, are cutting down subscriptions, that's actually relatively easy. You just need the numbers. Um, I'd say with open courseware, it's a little harder, but still not impossible. And it depends on shifting the frame to understand the size of the educational uh, uh, industry uh, and the, I mean, the number of people working, the amount of money, and the relatively tiny portion that goes into um, um, uh, publishing. Uh, by comparison to the entire system with tens of millions of students, et cetera, is just tiny. So there are the discrete answers, which is to say in this particular industry, you map out the economic model and you show that it's really very small. In that particular industry, you show, for example, depending on what the level of education is and what country you are, how much you have public funding, how much you have educational uh, investment by uh, markets. There's a market. The, so that's in those particular two. The more general claim is, and this may be a little bit of an answer, I guess, uh, um, also to Jay. Um, there is hard work in building the actual detailed arguments for every given industry that successfully break down the incredibly powerful move to abstract away. Right? We've got the copyright industries. We've got the IP industries. That creates. Uh, uh, such a high level of abstraction of what the actual economics are that you ignore the fact that pop music is different from jazz, is different from classical in terms of where the sources of revenue are, how they play out, that any of these are different from trade books and different from fiction, and bringing things to more concrete evidence-based policy in each of these and leveraging the force that we have of saying, fine, I get your model, what's the evidence? What's the actual industrial structure? How does it play? Bringing it down back to the concrete, why in your industry it works as opposed to why it won't work, is the big move that I think we all need to learn how to do. And that takes work, but I think it's in that context of instead of saying different theories across from each other, the evidence pulls back away from the abstracted theory. The market. The free market in its abstract sense is a utopian vision. It's not a practical system anyone lives in. You just need to bring that down to the details of the systems themselves. Okay, um, maybe we are in behind the schedule so we don't have enough time. So we can receive just two questions more. Okay, please. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Hal Plotkin, presently with uh, CCUSA. Larry, it's so great to see you here. Thank you for making the trip. Um, uh, the, the response you just gave and, and Cable's wonderful question uh, focused on our opponents and how we overcome their arguments. But in my experience, our opponents are a tiny minority of the population, the people who actively contest us. 
typically out of very narrow self-interest. And our larger problem are the, the cynics and the apathetic and the people who have just been conditioned to learned helplessness about the circumstances that we all confront. And I wonder what thoughts all three of you have about how we break through that and how we engage and re-engage the imagination of the broad, uh, discouraged public around the world um, <clears throat> that knows uh, that the systems they live under are not working for them, but that are not convinced that there's anything that they can do about it. Yeah, that's a great question. The, uh, <clears throat> we, um, before, long before I got into this race, we did a poll um, in the United States. We found 96% of Americans basically thought the money in the system was corrupt and had to be taken out. Um, but 91% didn't think it was possible. So those two numbers together is the politics of resignation. You know, so if you'd gone to Egypt under Mubarak and you'd said to the Egyptians, what do you think of Mubarak? They, you know, they would not have been enthusiastic about Mubarak. And if you would have said, well, why aren't you out there in the streets? They would have said, what do you think, we're nuts? <laughs> we're not in the streets, because what are we gonna do? Um, um, and you know, the same thing across history in many different contexts. If you don't believe it's possible, you're gonna accept the reality and get on with your life. But what that points to, and the Arab Spring is a, is a good example of this, is the incredible instability of that case. Because if you can begin to give people an image, a picture of how th something different is possible, that thaws the resignation and, and unleashes en enormous potential energy to actually begin to do things. And I think that's part of what you know, the strategy of Yochai's work uh, throughout his career has been to surface particular empirical examples that, that people can't sort of dismiss just as kind of you know, an ideological claim made by some theorist about something. No, here is a real example of something really happening that's producing real results in the world and you can't assume it's not there. You have to see it. And, and if you have enough of those, I think you begin to make it hard for people to live in that place. Um, or at least that's the hope. I think that's the only example of success that we've seen about that. Um, I um, had, was invited to speak at the Copyright Society of the USA, the highest paid rights holding, defending lawyers, working for the largest industries. And uh, it was a weird panel, and we knew we were weird, and so we were talking about open source and copyright or um, Creative Commons, and they were looking at me. I had to explain Creative Commons to them because they didn't know what it was. Um, and they were looking at me like I was crazy, um, and I showed them the slide that says that there are 882 million licensed works in the world at our last count, and we expect to pass a billion in 2015. And some of them couldn't possibly fathom. They said, you know, one person said, why would you turn uh, wine into water? Um, and one of the lawyers on the panel beside me um, l looked over at three of us who came from different parts of the open community and said, you people, pointing at the audience, you people are the weird ones. These guys, they're the future. Regular folks are not the kinds of people who exploit their copyright. Regular folks care about the stuff that these people care about. And so that's just to say, we are actually in the main, even though they have the power right now. Um, and that's a really interesting place to be, so we need to figure out how to wield that power and how to engage those people so that they care about the benefits of open and that we're the answer to that. It's not about teaching them about licensing, it's about telling them the, the world they could have and then disrupting those markets and about changing that. And so I think that's what we're all here for to talk about the next few days. Um, and I'd only add one more um, thing. I mean, more than one, because I can never do less than that. Um, <laughs> one is... You know, Larry's books showed the way, right? Translating in, in ways that are really powerful. Um, <clears throat> I think practice, just people doing. One of the things I found most exciting was the Pew uh, survey uh, um, and the proportion of people who actually share stuff online. Make something and share it. Um, beyond the total numbers, the sheer share of people who actually have experienced with themselves, hey, this is really cool. Um, and the last piece is the politics. And, and Sopa Pepa on one hand and ACTA on the other in the US and Europe 
were a major transitional moment. We've now seen repeated efforts, and now the victory in net neutrality in the US again. Um, one way in which you actually feel like you can do something is winning. And so continuing to win and getting two, three million people to call Congress, that's a way of getting people to overcome. That's the version of seeing it work. And the big failure, this is just one thing. If people remember, Occupy felt like it was a failure. If you actually plug income inequality into Google Trends, what you'll see is that, that the occupation of Zuccotti Park is the date on which the level of searches for the term income inequality in the US just completely changed in terms of its popularity relative to the uh, six or seven years before that of data available. You change people's minds and you show people you can succeed and then it feeds back. That's the hopeful version. Okay. No question? So, yeah, I, I think we had a better wrap up this discussion. Um, thank you for the great speech and great discussion. And again, it's my honor to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you, people. Enjoy lunch. And in a thousand years, when all our bones have disappeared, and every word has been erased, still the rivers flow, the sun will blow.